נאוה רובין and מירב אחיסר. Both of them did their PhD uh, sort of in parallel to me. I think I was the first one. We were the second generation in, uh, of uh, Shaul's uh, students after Dubi and uh, Hedva. And uh, so uh, Mirav uh, followed me, came I think a, a year or two after me, and then uh, we uh, uh, had uh, Nava with us, and it was a fantastic time. A, a, again, I think that uh, not only with uh, Shaul, but also with Mirav and Nava, and it was, uh, I, I, I think of it when I remember these times, it's really a great intellectual uh, experience. So the first one is going to be Nava, and uh, she's going to talk about... Uh, I got the title, it's okay. You got the title. Unifying Principles in Perceptual Bi-Stability. Hmm, maybe. If this guy will... Uh, let me see here. Oh, come on. All righty. Good. All right, so I'm listed in the... In the program as uh, New York University, and all this work was done uh, at, Nor at NYU with the, the people listed here. But really, um, just this past summer, I actually um, moved considerably back east, though not all the way back. And um, so now I'm in Barcelona. And um, I'm going to talk about bi-stability. I uh, assume that uh, many of you know what it is, but for those who don't, you, you do, because you've seen um, examples of these stimuli that um, um, look like one thing, like the Necker cube, for example. All of you see it with one of the two facets, I don't know which, um, closer to you, but if you continue to, to uh, look at it for, um, con uh, for a while, it will uh, flip and then it will flip back. So that's the phenomenon of bi-stability. Now in the middle <coughs> is uh, the one that's uh, the figure ground alternations that um, are um, the demo that was uh, made by a guy called Edgar Rubin in the turn of the 20th century. Unfortunately, I cannot claim any uh, family, uh, not that I know at least. That didn't stop Shaul from uh, making, I, I think, the nicest uh, gift, personalized gift I ever got when I finished my PhD and, um, and um, was going for my postdoc, he got Merav and Shaul uh, to photograph me from profile under false pretense in front of a dark screen that we had in the lab and then use that to, uh, to create a personalized Rubin uh, face vase illusion, which I have kept all these years on my wall um, at NYU and didn't think about the fact that I need to take it so that I can uh, scan it and show it here. So I'm telling you guys about it because I didn't ha I just realized before I came that I don't have it. So uh, this one is actually, maybe some of you um, rec uh, recognize the face, if not. Yeah, Dabia is, uh, so uh, Robert Sikuler is a fellow uh, vision scientist. He presented this in, um, in a conference in, uh, I think, 02 or something like that. And I had to go uh, and tell him that uh, Charles had the idea before. Um, but uh, anyway, OK. And um, <coughs> what is perhaps the most heavily studied uh, phenomena of uh, bistability uh, is binocular rivalry. And binocular rivalry was really the, the phenomena that uh, led uh, Jean-Michel and me into uh, working on, um, on bi-stability, but not because we were interested in it. W what we were interested in is motion perception. Um, <coughs> so I will now show you the demo of the bi-stable motion stimulus. So if you look at this stimulus, uh, it helps if you fixate, although you don't have to. Uh, at first, it looks like this crisscross pattern that moves to the right. But I already hear some people here undergoing what is a really dramatic perceptual transition where the, the two gradings sort of separate from each other and they start to slide uh, across each other. In this case, um, up and down or slightly diagonally up and down. If you continue to watch it, it will come back and then, f and, uh, and then forward, etc. Now. Um, the last thing I want to show with this demo is the following. So I'm going to stop it. First, you're going to see a huge after effect, but that's not, the, that's not just fun. Okay, now I'm going to change the angle between the two gradings. So um, qualitatively, it's exactly the same stimulus, and I'm going to set it into motion. Um, <coughs> we played with the speed a little bit. It helps if you speed it up. But quantitatively, something very, very dramatic 
happens, which in order to, to really quantify, you need to, to do long uh, experiments uh, with long duration. So we take people in the lab, we sit them there, we, we give them each of those stimuli for something like, let's say, two minutes, and we ask them to hold one button um, as long as they, s they see the together motion, and then switch to the other button when it separates. And then when it binds together again, to go back, the so continually tell us what they see. And what we know is that depending on the angle between these two gradings, uh, the proportion of time that you spend in one or the other can change quite dramatically. And I'll come back. So the reason I wanted you to experience this. So you see, throughout the time that I'm talking, and this is in the background, many of you have not yet uh, experienced a single uh, transition yet. OK? Good. So I'm going to stop it again. You can get the rush of um, and uh, let's go back to static. No, actually, we're not going back to static stimuli. We are, so why study this um, weird and esoteric stimulus? Well, we believe that it's actually a good um, <coughs> model for much more generally uh, useful motion computations that the brain does that we don't understand. So this is a real world movie. This thing is made from a real world movie that we took each frame and we edge detected it and then we put it back. Okay? When I show you each frame alone, very few of the people here in the um, hmm, this doesn't seem to be moving. But let me try to ah, oh, that is not nice. Let me try again. It'll take a second, but hopefully okay, let's hope that this was just a look of many okay yeah okay so you can see each one is a separate frame but if i just show you the frame and we control for that um as many frames as you like you're not going to see it. but once i set it in motion you see it immediately so motion is a very strong and potent cue for uh binding okay however from a computational point of view your brain is right now doing a truly computational feat um, one uh, line of evidence for it is that my friends and colleagues in computer vision still don't have good algorithms to perform this, um, this uh, task. So if I gave them this movie, they wouldn't be able to come back and, and, and give me the, the, the what we are seeing now. And the reason for that is that there is a problem here that of bootstrapping that in order to bind together the, the pieces that belong to one dog versus another, you need to know which ones. But in order to know which ones, you need to bind together, etc. Okay? So we really um, were interested in that. We wanted to work on, on motion, and uh, specifically how the brain takes local motion cues or measurements, and on the one hand finds which are the ones that belong together to integrate them to the global percept, because each of them alone can be moving quite in different directions. That's what happens in the, and which to segment. And the plot has been suggested as, and has been used before as a good um, sort of lab condition for that. Um, but in, s in spite of the fact that it's been used extensively in the modern literature, uh, unlike the classical literature, so Wallach, Hans Wallach is, is the guy that uh, originally um, um, presented the stimulus. And Hans Wallach actually commented quite heavily on its bistable nature. But in the modern literature, since it's been popularized by Elson and Mofshon, they used uh, brief presentations. And when you use brief presentation and kind of get away from the issue of the, the ambiguity that leads to bistability, uh, you simplify your life. But as we um, uh, have seen later, you, act you, you also lose a lot. So what we wanted to know was uh, what we said is, look, we know that in binocular rivalry, um, in the, in, so Jamshan and I started this project in the early 2000s, and during the 90s, there's been a lot of progress in binocular rivalry, and they developed a bunch of paradigms for studying the dynamics of bistability that we thought maybe we can kind of really steal to use uh, on the PLAD stimulus. So that was really the original idea. And we wanted to do it bo both behaviorally and in the magnet, and we did both. But today, I really will talk only about the behavioral and the computational results. So that was the original impetus. Like I said, I mean, we, we basically copied their paradigm where they asked people, what do you see? Do you see a house that you get on the right uh, uh, eye or face, etc." cetera? Um, OK. So that was the original motivation. It's written here. Use dynamics methods to study motion segmentation integration. But as we started doing that, 
every new stone that we turned, everything that we looked at, what we found is that there are absolute commonalities between these two phenomena. So even though these are completely different perceptual domains that work on what we believe to be completely different uh, neural substrates in terms of the actual tissue, they seem to have behind them uh, computational principles, and therefore we think also uh, architectural principles, that are common, that are similar. And so we decided to go uh, after that. And sort of the, the, the research program, in some sense, uh, revert the, the, the direction of the arrow reverted. And we started really looking at the dynamics of bi-stability across many different phenomena. We used motion segmentation integration most heavily because that was our, our expertise. That's what we knew you know, the best. And, uh, and also, I think, so you probably noticed this in the, in the demo, the transitions are very, very sharp, very dramatic. It's actually a really easy task for subjects to do. You get amazingly clean data much cleaner than you get in other phenomena, even binocular corrivery, which is maybe the second best, but certainly better than um, a Necker cube, et cetera. OK. And the, the sort of ambitious thing was to see if it can reveal us, uh, reveal any general principles about brain architecture. It took a, a long time, but I, I'm hoping to convince you today that we have some um, insights that really are very, very general. OK. So in order to do that, I need to now take you through a little bit of the trenches just to uh, introduce the two uh, major dynamics-based measures that we extract from these data. So remember I told you the subject sits and that's the raw data that they give us these trains. And the first obvious thing that you can do, you use fixed durations of trials, let's say two minutes, and you just sum up all the snippets of time that they said I see one thing, all the snippets of time they said the other thing, and you just take the fraction of the two, okay? So F is the fraction of one of the two, it doesn't matter which, arbitrarily we pick one of them. Later on I'll just call the two percepts A and B, okay? In this case, this is F coherence. And the demo that I showed you before of changing the angle, um, when you actually uh, take data, presents itself as something like that. So what we have here on the x-axis is the angle between the two. So the first demo that I showed you was more or less around here because I wanted it to separate for you really fast. And then I moved to more or less around here, and you saw that it doesn't separate. But if you wait long enough, you will separate. And so <laughs> the first observation that I want you to take from this is that this graph is very gradual. So this fraction changes as a function of the parameter that I'm tweaking very, very gradually. In this case, almost linearly, although in general, we don't <coughs> as you'll see, we don't make claims about it. This is very different from the picture that existed in the literature previously when people used only uh, brief presentations. Because when people used only brief presentations, what they got were things like that. So the x-axis here is exactly the same as before. They did the same experiment. But instead of giving you two minutes and asking what you see now, what you see that uh, now, they just gave you a second and said, what do you see? Okay? And what happens in those conditions is that as long as you're above, uh, excuse me, below a certain angle, 100% of the time people say, I see the together motion. And once you cross it, very quickly people transit to the other uh, extreme where 100% of the time they say, I see separate motion. So it looks as if this, the system is making one binary decision and, and uh, retires kind of thing. But reality doesn't. That's the first similarity that we knew already from binocular ivory, and since then we've found on all other bistable uh, phenomena, which is that the system over time sort of hedges its bets between the two interpretations in very, very systematic ways. Okay? You can affect them, you can change them. These two curves here we got by changing some other parameters, some orthogonal parameters. You can even change it by attention, for example. Bias people tell them, try as much as you can to see it as coherent, let's say. That will nudge it up, or segmented, that will nudge it down. But it will always you know, maintain that, um, that feature. OK, <coughs> where do we want to go from here? So that was one measure. Now, the next measure. Same data. But now we're going to do what I call an across trial measure. So the measure that we did before, from a single trial, you get an F, which is actually a pretty good, um, um, <coughs> the, the, the averages are pretty good. 
here you need to now uh, uh, excuse me repeat the the exact same configuration so for the same alpha let's say you repeat many many tries and it looks completely completely chaotic once you get this the second time you get this etc but it turns out that if you now take one bag and throw in it all the durations of the very first time that the subject said I said this all the durations of the second time the third time etc and you draw them as distribution, so this is the epoch number, the first time, the second time, etc. what you get is a very, very um, convincing empirical proof that the distributions of these uh, precept durations are stationary, <coughs> okay? The mean doesn't change over time. The variance doesn't change over time. I, I will say already, is it, so I'm not gonna talk a lot about um, the modeling work, the mechanistic modeling work that we have done, only come back to it at the end. But I will say here, because there's so many modelings, uh, modelers in the, in the crowd, that this was one of the first clues that we got to the <coughs> realization that existing models are missing something very fundamental. Because in all the existing models, um, the alternations are driven very strongly by adaptation. And in such cases, you get very strong predictions about what will happen to the mean durations from one uh, epoch to the other. It seems here that what we have is mo much more like what physicists call the renewal process, where every switch kind of just throws the dice all together. So we started working very, very um, uh, a lot with, with the next group of people that was uh, listed there, Ruben, uh, Moreno Botte, John Winzel, and Asa Shapiro, on noise driven attractor models to, to understand this phenomenon. But for now, <coughs> we really just want to make the point that we can take these. Uh, distributions now and extract a single number from them, which is the mean, okay? And it doesn't depend on how long my trials would be, etc. okay? So it's really a property of the stimulus, but it's a property of the stimulus for a particular, um, for a particular con stimulus configuration. And now you go around and you change the stimulus configuration as we saw. Let's say you change the angle. What's gonna happen to those mean durations? Okay, I showed you that. So, <laughs> arithmetically, these two mean durations, which are measured in, in absolute time, right, um, can change independently as soon as you move away from what I, co uh, what I call equidominance, okay? So equidominance is when they're at 50-50. As soon as you change whatever parameter and move, let's say, to 40-60, okay, there's an infinite number of pairs of numbers that could give you that. So arithmetically, that's what I mean by arithmetically, the, the durations of A and B can change independently from each other, regardless of what their value was at equidominance, okay? The question is, are they also independent empirically? The answer that I will show you today is, what I'll show you today is that the answer is no. But it took us 68 to uh, 2008 is uh, 40 something years to get to that answer. Um, <coughs> because for a long time, ourselves included, thought that the answer was yes, and that it was, and, and, and there were a lot of implications for it. And therefore now there are a lot of implications to the fact that the answer is no. Um, so in 1968, Levelt published a seminal work called On Biocoravery, where he measured everything under the sun. And he made a, an interesting observation, which is that changing the stimulation strength to only one eye. So in Baroque rivalry, you start with, uh, actually I have it in slides. So let's say you start, <coughs> so the x-axis now is gonna be the contrast of one of the eyes, let's say the left, okay? The right eye contrast is gonna be fixed on some number. Let's say that number is 80, whatever, okay? So when the left eye is on the same contrast, subjects will be at 50-50, will be at equidominance, okay? So the, the fraction will be 0.5, and the mean durations will have some number, I don't know, three seconds, okay? <coughs> now, Levelt took that contrast of the left eye and, and ran it down, okay? So the stimulus, instead of looking like that, now it looks like this. You see, this one is more faint now. Now, if you ask what happens to the fraction, obviously, if one goes up, the other has to go down. By definition, they add up to one. But Levelt's observation was that if he looks at the absolute times, okay, the 
the midrations of the eye that he actually manipulated, the left eye, hardly changed. And what changed is the other. Now, when I say that Lavelle sort of, in some senses, led us astray, I don't mean that. Th that result, to first approximation, holds quite well. Okay? It's, it's, it's other things related to it. So first of all, as you'll see, the other side of this graph later on does not hold. So he was just, by a fluke, he measured it in a particular way. I'll get to that. Um, <coughs> but more importantly is the connection that Lavelle made between the notion of absolute times and the notion, I want to plant this idea in your head now, of something having to do with absolute strengths of stimulation. Note that he was saying, I'm going to change the contrast to one eye without affecting the contrast to the other. Okay? So there is an assumption here that that's something that you can do, so that you can uh, talk about absolute strengths. Okay? Turns out, together with the fact that <coughs> you can't actually change them independently, you also can talk about absolute strength. So, okay. But like I said, this particular experiment holds. So these are data from Nikos Logothetis uh, and, and uh, David Leopold. Um, <coughs> in fact, that's how uh, I found out about uh, this whole level thing. I didn't know about it. Shaul, uh, you have to add it to the curriculum. Um, <coughs> but when we uh, learn about it, we're very interested. And the reason is that, uh, again, the modelers among you or those that are sort of modeling inclined will already see that this phenomena uh, implies that there is some coupling between the two uh, populations. Because if you make a change to one and you affect the other, it means that you can't think of them as sort of independent of each other. And we were very interested in that because um, in motion, um, we thought that something similar happens of some kind of competition between the two populations, the population that try to put together cues and the uh, motion cues and the population that tries to segment. And so we thought we want to go after this. We want to see whether we can find a um, <coughs> generalization to Lavelle's uh, idea uh, in other domains. So that's why we're interested in this. But if you think about this, it's not so simple. And why is that? That thing that I said of changing the strength of simulation to one population of, let's say, monocular cells in V1 without affecting the other is something that seems like you can talk about in, in, uh, in binocular ivory. But in motion, when I change the angle between these two gratings, we don't understand motion well enough to know, am I strengthening the segmentation? Am I weakening the integration? Am I doing both at the same time? So there was something kind of a little circular here. Suppose that we can, but we said we're going to try it anyway. <coughs> and this work now, I'm um, uh, this is the work that, that uh, we've done, the, the experimental work that we've done with Ruben, Marona Bouté, and, uh, and Asya Shapiro. So we took these three phenomena, the binocular ivory, and this is, so I mentioned already, so Lavelle's experiment basically was kind of in that realm, okay? And you can see here that as he reduces the contrast of what here is the red eye, okay? The red eye changes very little, but the green eye changes a lot. But if he just did the experiment in the opposite direction, he would get the opposite result. So that's the first sort of, but more importantly than that is the fact that you, as you move away from, um, from um, uh, equidominance, you do find this thing that one of them changes a lot while the other doesn't. And yet at the same time, these three, uh, I didn't, so this is the plaid that I showed you, and this is the third phenomena, which is if you go with the plaid to uh, domains where the angle is so big that almost all the time you see transparency, you start noticing alterations between which is in front and which is in the back. And you can affect which one looks in the front, which one looks in the back by changing, for example, the, the wavelength of the gratings, okay? And I have a demo for that, but it's been crashing my computer all the time. So if I have time, I'll, I'll show it, not even at the end, after I have stopped, because uh, she's going to use this computer too. So we'll see. Um, so, we, so, so we got these curves, and it sort of seemed uh, somewhat encouraging that we have this kind of like one is changing, the other is not, and stuff. But at the same time, they're like, how do you compare them? It's like apples and oranges. And we're like, how do we put them in the same footing? Here I'm changing contrast to one eye. Here I'm changing angle. 
they're just computers. How do I turn it into a currency? How do I get a common currency? And we thought about it a lot, and then we realized one day that here's the problem. The problem is that each of, so I just put on the screen another graph, um, these um, um, gray graphs, OK? And the axis for the y-axis is on the right now. This is the fraction dominance. So um, as you change the contrast, the, you affect the fraction dominance in this particular way. And as you change the angle, you affect the fraction. So the, the graph that I showed you before of the fraction dominance was kind of a zoom in on this region. But if you do the whole range, you get this kind of weird looking thing. And here you get this one. And what we realize we need to do is we need to rescale the x-axis into units that will give you equal change in fraction. So first, you basically do it manually. And there's not, it's not like you can take the log or something. You really have to do a lookup table kind of thing if you want to do it that way. So <coughs> when you do that, now it's redundant that f is just going to be linear, right? Look at these three curves. They look very similar to each other. But in fact, if you think about it a little more, you realize that doing that is more equivalent to redrawing your t values against f itself. Because if f is going to be linear, then it's like redrawing it against f itself. So in this particular case, the, if instead of now saying, what is the um, contrast that would give me a linear fraction, I just say, let me draw t a and t b against their fraction, which is just TA over TA plus TB, you get the exact same curve. And some of you know, and some of you uh, uh, So go offline later and think about it, but it, it, it works. Um, so first of all, ah, right. So the last observation we had in this paper is that, uh, so I have about 12 more minutes, something like that? Okay. The last observation we had in this paper is as follows. So if you take these replotted curves, that look much more similar to each other. And you just now um, uh, reflect the TB across 0.5, OK? They lie right on top of each other. What that means is that they are like symmetric. You can predict what TB will be at any value f, let's say 0.3, by what TA is by the value of TA at 1 minus f, OK? So when you reflect, they're symmetric. OK, at that point, um, I had a sabbatical, and I knew that I'm, uh, anyway, I started winding down the lab. And uh, no more experiment for a year or so. And one day, it dawned on me that uh, maybe I don't need to do experiment in order to continue to research. There's all this data in the literature that I can do, uh, I can go and uh, redo the same analysis too. So any paper that has in it uh, and there's a lot of these papers because, as I mentioned, well, I don't know, not quite 20, but almost, um, going all the way back to 1960, okay, um, but especially an explosion after 68, uh, Levelt uh, uh, created a lot of interest. So many people wanted to see what the effects are. And then there are a whole bunch of other uh, papers that just wanted to look at the effect of parameters. And Unfortunately, the vast majority of papers in the literature really only uh, look at the fraction. And I need more than that. Or they look at the fraction, they give you a mean duration of one, but not the other. That's really frustrating, because I can't use that, those data either. But for the papers that I have both, I could do that. Now, originally, the data looked like anything. Sometimes it looked like things like the curves I showed before. But other people just had them in, in tables or in bar diagrams. Because in this particular case, for example, the, the changes that they made were not even uh, some continuous parameter. They just did that configuration, that configuration. But if I have the data, I can do this thing. I can just take TATB, calculate F, and redraw. So that's what we've been doing <coughs> on all these papers. So that was heroic work that Zoe Talbot has been doing with me. We take these old papers and we uh, use a, a graphics program to kind of extract the xy value from it. And then we make sure by reconstructing them that we did it correctly. And then you, you replot them. And as you replot them, one paper after another is coming out looking very nicely symmetric around f. Okay. 
The next thing we noticed is that there is one more thing that we can do. Okay, so this is one, this is Kakizaki, this is Fox. Some of them have a lot of data throughout, some of them in one side, etc. Um, the last thing we can do is we can normalize by the value of the mean durations at the equidominance, okay? So that now gives me these curves um, in a dimensionless way, if you will. And what that means is that now I can superimpose all these studies on top of each other. And that's what I get when I do that. So they all cluster along one cloud for TA and one cloud for TB, okay? Lastly, I will now tell you that the curve that's plotted in the background is not some best fit that we did. The curve is simply that equation. Now, where did they get that equation from? So, turns out that now that you know the now that we knew the answer that it has to be symmetric, that it falls on it, we said, then that means you know it's not a miracle. It's because the math forces it. Something forces it. So you start thinking, what is it that forces it? And you realize that you can, you know, basically almost prove it, okay? You'll see what I mean by almost. So by definition, this is the definition of F, right? But if we now know that these two curves are symmetric about 0.5, then that means that you also have this uh, relationship, and you can take this relationship and stick TB there that way, and essentially get that the, the curve T must, um, must obey this relationship. So the value of any curve T here at whatever F equal 0.3 divided by the value of the same curve at 0 0.7 must, um, equal, uh, must be equal to 0.3 over 0.7 and vice versa, okay? All right. Then you go to your friends in Courant and to other people and tell them, all right, what, give me the solution. What kind of functions, you know, have this property? And I don't want to go into that, but that's what I meant by almost. I can tell you that the following function has this property. You can check it on your own. Uh, that any function that is a constant times this value will do it. And that no other um, uh, power of f over 1 over f. So, so if you assume, let's say, that it's a power uh, of f over 1 over f, it has to be a half. It has to be. But we, do, we don't have yet a, a, a general proof that, that nothing else. So we're sort of incrementing towards it. But what we have is this, that when you draw it, th so that's why I think that we have to be able to find a proof because it works really, really, really amazingly well. OK. So now back to what does that mean? So just describing the, the result themselves, what it means is that away from equidominance, the T and TV, the mean dominance durations, actually don't carry an additional degree of freedom, not even one, let alone two independent ones, OK? Uh, but rather, they are just determined by F what F is. So if I know what the mean duration is at equidominance, I know what its value is going to be when I move away from it. Um, now, what does it mean about the underlying system? Remember that I already primed you to the fact that Levet made a tie between the absolute mean durations and this notion of absolute strength of the stimulation, okay? So if the mean durations don't carry an, a, an independent degree of freedom, maybe what it means is that the input strengths themselves don't carry an independent degree of freedom. And indeed, we think that that's what it means. In other words, here is your ambiguous stimulus, and it exerts some stimulation on one population and some other value of stimulation on the other population. Okay? Now you go and you're going to say, I'm going to now fatten only the, the, the white axis. But inside, the system is going to go and normalize it, essentially so that only relative strengths are going to matter, okay? And interestingly, in the modeling work that we have done before we knew all that in 2007, we stumbled on the need to have a, 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 a common pool that effectively did this, do I have it? Mm, sorry. That effectively did this normalization in order to get the Levelt's property without knowing that 
it cannot change independently, just to get it look qualitatively similarly, okay? All right, so the one open question that remains that I think is really interesting to think about is what controls this one degree of freedom that does exist um, separately, it seems, from uh, F, from the relative, which is the value of the, the rate of alternations at equidominance, okay? Um, it varies between phenomena for the same subject. It varies between subjects. We don't know what it is but we have very strong reasons to suspect that it is uh, controlled by an independent mechanism, okay? Um, and I think I'll stop here. So uh, these are, again, the people, some of those I didn't mention their work directly, but they were involved in the bi-stability, and I also want to thank the um, funding agencies. Friend. With binocular ivory, you have this uh, cases where you don't have one dominant uh, image over the other, but sometimes you have this uh, transition Mixture. periods where mm -hmm. you have this peak So how, mm -hmm. do, how do you account for that here? Or so how do I account for that? In the, so in terms of the mechanisms behind, what it means is that what we call mutual exclusivity, this uh, mechanism that, uh, that uh, the brain has where it doesn't allow both precepts to exist at the same time. And we already know that corresponding to that, uh, the, the, the activity of the perceived interpretation is, is higher uh, when it's dominant than when it's uh, suppressed. Um, that mechanism is not foolproof, okay? The fact that you have these mixed precepts sometimes means that uh, that the uh, mutual exclusivity is not implemented in a foolproof way. Well, not an emotion, right? I mean, right. And I think that's very interesting in the sense, so, so we have ideas about why it is, and it really goes to the departures from commonality that have to do with the specific uh, neural tissue that implements, you know, um, this type of competition versus another type of competition. So I didn't mention, so what, the, what we now believe is that there is a common what I call architecture in all those cases where there is this competition between the neural populations that represent the, the different interpretations. We don't think that the competition occurs through lateral inhibition like in many of my little cartoons. Uh, certainly not in the sense that it's direct, no. It may be that it's mediated <coughs> through a common pool or we are now working on models that actually don't even use inhibition at all. So in terms of how the model is implemented, that, that varies from one to the other. But, uh, but when you abstract it out, really what you have is a mechanism to make sure that only one population can dominate. And then, depending on the, the, the tissue, in some cases, that mechanism is not completely foolproof and this, then the system can, in certain conditions, sort of have this coexistence. And in others, less so. Oh, so I mentioned that before. Um, so you can ask people to, to try to hold on to one or to try to see one more than the other. And what it does is that it will, it will, um, it will change the, the, the breakpoint of this curve, but it won't change the fact that parameters, like uh, bottom-up parameters that affect the balance of power, uh, still will be uh, very effective and, and uh, not just that, uh, they seem to be independent, so the curves go sort of parallel to each other. Can you take the questions today? Sure. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I have two related questions. Um, one is, in my experience with the plaid, the, uh, what did you call it, the non-coherent condition also had some other degree of freedom to the direction of motion. That uh, no, I think what it slides, it slides in different in different directions. Oh, do, okay. So that that's it true. It's well, it's not just here. Mathematically, it's true. What varies between people is that uh, most people actually perceive it very uh, stable, either up or down, up and down, or obliquely, but don't kind of drift between these two. Um, 
but I guess some people do. It's true. So there are other ambiguities, and I think it's actually you have to you, you should have this conversation with Jean Michel because that's something that he's very interested in. These uh, extra so there is this hierarchy of ambiguities <laughs> that you can then use to try to make predictions about how the system will divide its time between the different sub. Uh, that's what I was going to ask about. If that, if that had any effect on it does, it does, absolutely, yes. We haven't had it in those because they're not the best for that. Anyway. No, I think we should move on. Thank you very much, Nava. She's Merava Chisar, and uh, I would not be surprised if she talks about the reverse hierarchy. You'll be surprised, but I won't. Well, in the back of my mind. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to... Okay, um, so I'm not going to go into anecdotes. I'd just like to thank you, Shaul. Um, I think to thank you in a very deep sense because one of the main things that was special in the lab was that we could ask anything without feeling embarrassed. This is very difficult. I haven't, I've failed <laughs> to, to incorporate that. Uh, and I, I'll try, but at least it, it, I think it had impact, a very deep impact, not on how we also, we only just talked about things, but on how we thought about things. And this will be kind of a justification for what I'm going to suggest today. We can ask about everything, so why <laughs> don't we take the liberty and do that? And what I'd like to do is suggest what I think, well, I don't, is a different, is a different view. I'll make it a bit of a caricature to make things simple and clear and make a, you know, uh, um, an obvious statement, which is, we could define it as, so what is, I'll make it a bit binary. What is perception? What is cognition? What does the, oh, no, I need, okay. What does, I can't do it all. אי אפשר לקרב את זה, אה? זה גם עובד? כשאני מדברת רגיל, אני שומעת לי שלא כל כך... שומעים אותי? וואו, אוקיי. אוקיי. So what I'll try to make is sort of bind what is in a very gross way, sort of the difference between frontal activities, posterior activities, and I'd like to link it to the concept of perception versus cognition. So it's not, if you... Take the pieces together, it's not very different than what people are saying today. It's just putting the pieces somewhat in a different manner. So basically we say, okay, we've seen that, and, and Udi took it just now from, from the internet. So this is motor. This is kind of perception, globally speaking. This is where we get really smart. The more, the higher we go, this is smarter. This is the aura, which you sometimes can find in fMRI finding. This is really beyond. But, but, but I'll, stick to, <laughs> I'll stick to this range. Um, what I'd like to suggest is the difference between posterior and, and, and frontal activity, or between cogn cognitive and perceptual tasks, or between complex and simple tasks, is not really about the complexity or the seeming complexity of the task, but about how experienced with we are with performing this task. This is what we do when we perform a novel task. And I will dwell into what seems like simple perceptual tasks, but what do we do with them when we are naive to them and try to follow the process of learning these tasks as they, I will suggest, become from cognitive to perceptual tasks. And this is linked with the process whereby the underlying the underlying sort of circuitry is initially frontal and gradually regressing to be more and more posterior along the reverse hierarchy. Uh, so if I'd like to sort of summarize, and, 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 and the rest will be just details putting into it, is like all this is in a way a bag of, of what? Of perceptions, but perception stores in forms of sort of sub-representations of the world in terms of what we care about the world. And the way we represent them is in schemes. And what is different in scheme versus an instance or sort of a bottom-up representation 
It's kind of an intermediate level representation that captures the part that we are interested in in the environment, the structural relations between the things we're interested, specifically for specific scenes. Um, so how do we get things to be from frontally based to posterior based? We get the structural regularities. And once we get the structural regularities, the nature of online computations that are needed to solve the task really changes because we have the basic structure. So it's very general, just more, one more sentence of sort of general introduction is, so what I'm saying is very consistent with lots of stuff that had been said. Frontal is high and posterior is low. The point is, and, and, and you can get things automatized, but the thing about automatization where traditional views have been emphasizing the consistency between stimulus and response. You get the same stimulus, map to the same response many, many times, you become automatized. It's not about stimulus response mapping because you have to figure out what it is that you're interested in within the complex stimulus. And this is what you do initially in the frontal based activity. And once you get this figured out, you can gradually sort of back source the structure of what you're looking for. This is very general. I'll try to be more specific as I go through the, the series of experiments that we've been doing. So I'm saying a big statement based on a very, very simple task. And I think it probes all these aspects. The benefit of this task is kind of paradoxical. Two-tone frequency discrimination. I'll try to show how you can become an expert and as such change the underlying connectivity with which you perform this task. And the benefit of it is in a paradoxical manner because it's very simple, but we never experienced pure tones in the environment. The most simple it is, as simple it is physically, we are really naive to this task. We don't have any experience with it. What we really have an experience with is scene identification, speech perception. So this gives us an opportunity to really track the learning process. Because we are never really asked to these kind of processes. We have the information. The question is how we access it and how we learn to access it. And this is what gets us to be experts, and I will track that. Um, the second part will be um, comparing between, OK, so we have to track regularities. What are the mechanisms that track regularities? And do we have specific mechanisms for different types, for different domains of regularities? I will dwell more on what regularities are. What I'll try to convince you with is that, well, auditory and visual may be separate, but within the auditory domain, regularities for pure tones and for speech sounds are governed, or detection is governed by the same mechanism. This has deep implications because it taps onto a big battle of how specific language is, and it will tap on the last topic I'd like to address, and can we have crosstalk and generalization between musical education, which gets us to be sensitive to regularities and to all sorts of aspects I'll try to mention, and be better in linguistic abilities, and perhaps vice versa. But can we gain from that? And can we gain from any of what I've said to the benefit of humankind, whatever? So how do I? I don't know if you can hear it. No. OK. I'll sound I'm, I'm, I'm a real expert in making this task. Ah, it's a lot, actually. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> OK. <laughs> איך אני לוחצת על זה? It doesn't, wait, wait. I'm good, I'm good at making it. Wait, right now it's not even. It's stuck? No. No, it doesn't. It doesn't matter, forget it, forget it. I'll be the audio. Here's the task. Bum, bum. I made it easy for you. So I'm presenting, it's kind of pure, broader, somewhat, around pure, pure tones as, as, as close as I can make it to be. And so which tone was higher? Now <laughs> it's testing your working memory. This was not the point. But I guess it was the second. Now, so this is a simple task. It's a discrimination task. We're extremely good at it. Even though individuals really vary which, uh, on how good it is and what does it tap, I'll address it. But basically, it's considered to tap basic mechanisms because it's about frequency. Is frequency is already mapped a decochlea, right? So what is it? It's very simple. But now let's see how we can test this task. So we have a first tone. We have a second tone. And what do we do in order to solve it? 
remember that we perceive what is perceived. So we have some representation of the first tone activated. Then we have to retain it as long as we wait, which is about a second for the second tone. And then we have to compare. This is abstract comparison between two stimuli. This is, in a way, a very basic abstract operation which challenges our working memory, our ability to retain and maintain things at the same time. This is difficult. In a way, it's kind of tapping our basic intelligent abilities. If you measure the threshold, because it is a psychoacoustical task, so you can measure how large should be the difference in frequency, uh, in frequency in order for a person to do 80% correct. So it comes out, this is the average of, I don't know, like 80 students. <coughs> so it is about 10%. And if you do it a second time, it is a 10%. And now what I really am interested in is, what is the structure of the tones of the tone pairs that are repeated from one trial to another? So I presented just one trial. But the real thing is, what can you learn as you actually tested with the task? Because you tested for several dozen trials, and we address it as psychophysicists as if we're improving our statistics. But you manage to, I mean, of course you affect the perceptual system as you listen. And the way you affect it depends on what you stimulate it with. So the first presentation that I, the, the thresholds that I gave you just now were about things that do not carry any systematic relations between one trial and the other. So we kind of tap one and the other. So we, this is one frequency, the other, next trial, next trial, and next trial, and there's no systematic relations. However, what I'd like to convince you with is that we're still implicitly trying to get some form of regularity that we can you know, improve. We have all these vision examples that we try to make order in the environment. Even if it's not there, we're trying to impose order in the environment. We're trying to impose some consistency. And we assume something, this is just one example, I don't want to dwell into it, that there is a you know, a repetition, and the, the average frequency is going to repeat itself, and we compare something with the average that we kind of compute. I don't want to dwell into this example because you can make it much more easier. We're tracking the systematic repetitions is really, really useful. So this is one extreme case. The first tone is always kept the same frequency. In our case, 1,000 hertz. Of course, there's a task, so the second tone should be either higher or lower. And this, let's say, is a comparison tone. People don't get it because they're busy in figuring out which tone is higher. So they do the task, they don't, we ask them afterwards, they don't notice any regularities. But if we look at how they do, it's a huge difference. It's a tenfold difference. So the same individuals, rather than have a 10% threshold, they have a 1% threshold. Now, what is it that had changed? If you ask people, they do the same. If you look at when they respond, they do the same. What I'd like to suggest is that implicitly, they got the structure. The structure of information that we're giving them. And what is the structure? The first tone is always 1,000 hertz. Identifying this tone doesn't resolve the task, because this tone is either higher or lower. The information really resides in the second tone. So you still have to compare it. The question is, what do you compare it to? Do you really compare it to the just recent tone that you had, or to some internal reference, to some representation of this repeated tone, which I would suggest is not implemented by the same neural circuitry. So once you got the structure, you're unaware of it, but the system tracked the structure, maybe it tracks that it is still within the same domain, the scene hadn't changed, the events hadn't changed, it detects that it's the same reference, and now it's comparing to an internal reference, I'd suggest, <coughs> by posterior mechanisms. Why can these mechanisms be different? Because while you have to compare with ongoing stimuli, you have to retain the information between trials, probably governed by some kind of delayed activity, where neurons have to retain activity once, even after the stimulus had been not presented anymore. So you have to have special machinery for that. If you compare with an internal reference, you don't have to have special machinery of retention. Look at it. You don't have to measure. You can just you know, I, I, I'm looking at Udi and I identify Udi. How do I identify Udi? It could be they have done some delayed activity at the, you know, with my frontal, always there. But alternatively, there's some form of representation that is not always kept active, but is automatically retrieved by incoming stimuli. So the way this memory and this representation is maintained and this comparison implemented is different and relies on different circuitry. Let me try to prove it. 
one thing that is needed for that, by the way, is that we have to have some window of learning to, pre to, 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 to form these schemes because it can't be within the one to two second explicit working memory window because it's across, across trials, repetition that we get the systematic part and it's not long term because it works on naive individuals. This has not hardly been studied window of memory in, in, in cognitive in cognition. So how do I want to show you that? First, let me produce some other uh, combination. What if rather than the first tone fixed, the second tone is fixed? Okay? In terms of information, it's equivalent. If you look at how people do it, well, if you just let them do this whole block of several dozen trials, they manage to reach the same ability, which is about one and one, per one or so uh, percent difference in frequency to attain the same ability, to, to attain the same uh, percent correct. Now what I'm looking at is like this electrode, when a person performs a task, now first a block where the reference is always presented first, okay? And I'm looking at what happens when this person hears the trial and performs it. And if we look at the uh, basic ERP components, so what we have here, oh. so what we have here is this is the N1 in response to the first tone, N1 in response to the second tone, P2 to the first, P2 to the second, there's some kind of adaptation because the interval is not too long. This is kind of um, obligatory response from the auditory cortex, which is not important for the case of what I'm going to say now. What is really, oops, oops, oops. What is really crucial is this wave. This is what's called the P, P for positive three, for about 300 wave. If the person just hears it and is not asked to do a task, you don't see it. When you do get it is when a person has to make some categorical decision and manages to do it reasonably well. If he, tries, he or she tries and do it in a chance level, you don't see it. So this indicates when a categorical decision had been made. What's interesting about this component is that it's there even if the person is not aware of this decision. So it's kind of a way to go beyond what people in prospection tells them and see what happens. So this is what happens when the first tone is fixed and the second tone is higher or lower decision is made here, obviously. How can you make a decision earlier? You don't have the information. However, what's really interesting is what happens when the second tone is fixed and the first tone is the informative one being either higher or lower. So at the end of the trial, even though the person pushes the button here and claims to make a decision here, there's nothing here. The decision sort of wave, the implicit decision wave, is shifted to follow the first tone which means that an implicit decision had been made with respect to comparing the two tones before the second tone was actually presented. So how can you do that? My interpretation is that you really compare this tone to an internal reference. You assume implicitly that this, what had been done, will continue to be, it will continue on. And here you can make a decision whether it's higher <coughs> or lower than the internal reference. How fast does it happen? within 10 trials or so, when it's very simple, with this condition, which is a little harder, it takes more time. But I'd like to say something else beyond that. So you do that, and you do that for, let's say, one day, second day, perceptual learning. So um, this was within a day, but you get a person to come, this is a group, the second day, third day, because I don't have, for other reasons, the first day here, and then you see improvement. And then they come the next day, and they keep on performing the same task as much as they know, because it's the same tones, same two-tone frequency discrimination, same task, everything is the same, except what they're asked to do, uh, ex sorry, except the structure of information where the reference is second and the non-reference is first. So the only thing that had changed is the structure of information, where you have to look, or sort of in your mind's ear, for this information and you do not transfer and you can learn. So this learning was completely scheme structure specific. And just to say that it works in both ways, in both directions, this is a different group that learned the other the other uh, that learned in the other direction, that learned first with reference always being second, and then it came back. Couldn't tell that there was a difference, but we could see that they have to learn, they have to they degrade their performance and they have to relearn. Okay? So this is very different than traditional perceptual learning tasks where you either change the stimuli 
or you change what the person, what, what, what aspect the person is asked to attend to, because these have not been changed at all, and still um, you have to relearn. So what I was suggesting is that when you have this kind of regularity that you can track, that you can detect easily, and you can compare rather than between the two stimuli, this is frontal, with an, an internal reference, you can free your sort of limited resources, which would be working memory mechanisms in the frontal areas. Which means that if you compare what happens when you do a block with regularity versus a block with no regularity, you'll find the difference in the activity of working memory networks even when you equate for level of difficulty. So even when you make the physical differences larger, when there's no regularity, so it's not about an effort, a total effort, but about how this task is implemented, you will get a difference. And this is what we got. This is Luba's work. I, OK, the, the pictures with the names, I forget to say, but these are the people that conducted the study. So what we find is when we look at the contrast, when we look in the magnet and they do, blocks like that, blocks like that, again and again, in an interleaved manner, and we look at the contrast of what happens when there is no regularity versus there is regularity, you see this sort of frontal, parietal working memory network with some additional activity, which is not basic auditory cortex, but some highly associative, I don't want to get into specifically what part it is. So the idea I was trying to convey to you so far is that we are using two-tone discrimination because it's, you can, in a very sort of squeezed processes of learning, because it's a very simple regularity, a relatively simple task, from frontal to um, uh, posterior scheme-based activities um, quickly. However, the other thing is different individuals are e efficient to different levels in detecting these regularities. And historically speaking, this is how we got to the whole task in the first place. We were thinking about dyslexia. And dyslexics are individuals who have difficulties in acquiring reading, but it typically goes together with us working memory difficulties, verbal working memory difficulties, some other aspects of linguistic difficulties. And what we did was look at how they do two-tone discrimination. And we looked at the condition. And these are individuals who are about 13 years old. We went to a school. This is their peers who are good readers, and this is when there's no regularity, just what I showed you at the beginning, this is when there is regularity, a little different regularity, but it's the same principle, and this is what happens with the dyslexic population. So when we look at how they do in the non-standard condition, when there's no regularity, well, they're not too good, but they do not differ from their peers. However, when we look at how they do the standard, in this case, they're not improved by having a standard. So in a way, the suggestion is, yes, the basic processes are OK, but they keep being naive to an extent. They do not become expert. They have, I'm, I'm making an extreme case. It means that they are slower at that. They're not as efficient at that. So they become more, they, they are more frontally based rather than posterior based. And by the way, independently, there's been several fMRI studies that looked at dyslexic population versus non-dyslexic population. And what you see is increased frontal activities compared to uh, reduced posterior activity. Uh, frontal activities when they're trying to decipher things that they should have been pretty much expert with. So, so far, um, I've been giving one example, which is the two-tone discrimination task. And I've, 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 I've worked on that for a long time. And, uh, and when we did a study recently, we were asking, OK, how, how simple can we get? Can we, can, we, can we use an even simpler task and we were thinking, together with Nori uh, and, and Tali, because Nori works with Tali and me, what could be a simplest sensory model task that we can adequately measure? And you can measure the, the, the how accurate a person is, how consistent a person is, and, and, and see how this relates to the story. So we had this tapping. So you hear a metronome at about uh, 2 hertz, duck, duck, duck. And you can start tapping. And that's all you have to do, tap. Synchronize yourself with the metronome. So what kind of a task is it? Perceptual, is it low level, is it high level? Initially we thought, well, this is kind of a sensory motor, basic sensory motor control task. Now here is, so given this introduction, 
this long introduction, admittedly. What kind of a task do you think it is? So how do we measure that? We can look at where colors are spread, etc. Or one option is look at, and this is what we did, look at individual differences. So we had a large group of individuals who participated in the study in the lab, and we, among other tasks, look at how well they, how consistent they are in tapping, and how well they do in what is considered the gold standard of difficult, very demanding working memory tasks. Those of you are kind of have some, no, NBEC. You know what NBEC is? I'll show you an example of NBEC, but the idea is that it's a very demanding, high level working memory task, gives you a good prediction of how smart a person is in IQ tests, as good as it gets with a few minutes. And these are very, very tightly correlated. And amazingly, I mean, people who do psychophysics know that this is not an easy correlation to find. It's beyond 0.7. So is it a low level or high level? Well, it depends if you're naive or you're not naive. So if, and that's what we did, we looked at musicians. These are, these are musicians, okay? So the red points are the scatter plots that we get from musicians. So first you see, well, they, this will be the last part of my talk. They tend to have somewhat better and back. This is the score in the working memory. The higher you are, the better you are. And this is kind of, you want to be low because this is low viability. But the point is that if you look at this correlation, it's zero. There's no correlation. It's flattened. And even based on the same working memory abilities, they do better than the individual do. So once you're an expert, you lose or you gain. You get freed from the limited working memory resources that you have as a naive person. And I'd like to say that this naive dependence is true across tasks, even in the simplest cases. So this is just an interim, don't worry, it's an advanced part. Uh, so regularity detection is, the, I would like to say, the main tool of the cortex to attain expert level performance. <coughs> regularity detection allows performance to be scheme rather than working memory based. Well, working memory is a pretty broad notion and common mechanisms underlie regularity detection across auditory stimuli. And I gave the example of dyslexics who have difficulties in speed, sort of in acquiring some regularities in language, but have difficulties in two-tone discriminations, and there are studies, not ours, that show difficulties in tapping. Um, so is it worthwhile to have fancy or less fancy or whatever musical experience? Because I suggested that at least some aspects are shared. Some regularity detection aspects, working memory aspects, are shared between uh, general sounds and linguistic materials. Uh, so we tested this question. We had a large uh, uh, group that we studied, and we looked at to what extent the two-tone discrimination ability can predict. And these are individuals with no specific difficulty. General population of students who come to Israel to study Hebrew, and we test them on two-tone discrimination. And what we see is that overall, how they do in the random demanding task, two-tone discrimination, is very nicely, this is our square, correlated with the accuracy of their reading. This had been all, this, some kind of things were tested before, but even more surprisingly, or more strong finding, we found when we looked at their syntactic skills. I don't want to get into how we evaluate syntactic abilities. This is how you understand structures, fancy structures of sentences. This is a high level linguistic skill, and it's really very tightly linked with your ability to do wrong vein to do the random two-tone discrimination test. If you look more carefully at these individuals and you look at, okay, we see that those who are better at that do that good, but how can you become very good? Either you're very talented to begin with in this kind of task, or perhaps we can make you by training with musical uh, training, with, uh, or getting musical training. And if you see, these are individuals with high, a lot of musical training too, these are individuals with no musical training, and these are, no musical training is up to one year. A lot, a lot is like 10 years, and one is like two, three years of training. And you can see that it pushes your ability to do two-tone discrimination. And interestingly, this is how you do, it doesn't matter the details, but this is after three, four years, and even after 10 years, you get benefit. So becoming really an expert is not just a five-minute thing in the lab. 
you get even better after 10 versus 3 or 4 years of musical education. Last thing I want to say is, can we squeeze that? So it seems like you get some benefit with musical training, but to get real benefit, it seems like you need something like 10 years of musical training. With that time, you could potentially learn a language. I mean, you, you get some, some generalization, but the question is whether you really enjoy musical education. Maybe you could do something better with your time if you don't like it. So can we squeeze it? Can we do like intensive training in the lab, improve working memory skills in a general way, and be happy because we'll get generalization? So what is it that we want to train for? If I combine the first part of the talk, we don't want to train, so total discrimination is a name for a broad range of tasks. It really depends how you administer it rather than what is it that you're using. So it's different tasks. The comment I wanted to say to Doobie as well, but it's different tasks depending how you administer sequential stimuli. You call it the same, but it's not the same task. So we wanted to do something with no regularity because it has to push your working memory and potentially gets more generalization. So we train on the two-tone discrimination with no regularity, so it keeps changing, so you have to use your working memory. And we also trained another group on a working memory task, which is very demanding, but just, uh, this is a dugma, sorry. For NBAC task. So this is a special NBAC, this is what they trained with. And tell me if there's uh, the same place, position is repeated uh, with one interval, right? So, is there a repetition? Not yeah. immediately afterwards. Two. And it's like two back. Yeah. There's several repetitions. You have to continue. It's a cumulative pressure. So anyhow, this is the idea. People start with about two. Our participants train for at least 40 sessions. So they got to like n equals six or seven. This is pretty amazing. You cannot believe how well you can improve if you practice. The question is, what is it you learn after you practice. Sadly, you learn what you practice. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, I'm not sure many people would find great pride in sort of being, and so this is like the two groups, one trained with two-tone discrimination, one trained with NBEC. And the one that trained with, uh, this is pre and this is post, the one that trained with NBEC was wonderful in NBEC and no change in the frequency discrimination. The one that trained in frequency discrimination was good. In frequency discrimination, you want to get low, but no change in the other. And then we tested a zillion of other tasks. Third. So, um, I, I mean, for instance, uh, after you train for NBEC special, we trained with NBEC with another stimulus and there was no transfer. So even within the same task, seems like what, and, and maybe there's marginal fringe benefits, but, but very small. Basically, we do not find any general increase in working memory abilities. So even when you train with high level tasks, which are aimed to pound rather regularities on the ability to retain, to retain and compare, etc., etc., so at a high level, you, you get better by adopting some kind of a combination of stimulus and task strategy. It's, it, it seems like there's no fast lane to boost your working memory abilities in a general manner. Do we have plasticity? Yes, because if you look at individuals who have been training in a broad manner, because they were not just practicing in Twitter discrimination, they had a broad musical training education for several years, and it seems to have improved their working memory abilities also in linguistic, to an extent, but also in linguistic uh, um, conditions. But it takes time, and it's not so large. There is plasticity. We haven't found magic. Um, so just to conclude, Regularity detection seems to be the main tool of the cortex to attain expert level performance from, I would say, frontal to posterior, from computation, online computation, to scheme-based, where you kind of uh, don't have to, 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 to calculate everything. You know where the information resides, where you should attend, where the hotspots are, etc. The rate of regularity detection varies between conditions, of course. It, it's dictated by a combination of parameters, but also varies for the same physical condition between individuals and is correlated between different uh, auditory 
abilities and uh, thank you. I'm very surprised. <laughs> I can have a longer answer because uh, I, I haven't done that. Mm -hmm. uh, but this this issue of whether you can get generalization of working memory is in the midst of a big debate. It has the, the, the potential implications are huge. Um, and we've done th the reason we did it because I saw some study that seemed, well, maybe, and we sort of replicated studies that under exactly the same conditions got some things and I could see why they got these things. No, we, we got the same result for training the end. We, we could discuss it. We could discuss it. I think concept now now I think that conceptually speaking one has to be extremely broad across incoming uh, um, across trials, across consecutive events in order to uh, induce something which is broader, sort of, um, and, and I, I, I'm not sure whether you will, then you will, in this case, I think it's like musical training. So you get lots of situation, and you get something which is broad, et cetera, et cetera. I, I, I you know, Yagata Velomotsata, I, I, I've looked for it. I mean, I'm, I'm all for it, but uh, we couldn't find it. And, and other people, well, anyhow, we could talk afterwards. I'm looking at Sagi. Yes. <laughs> yes. There was feedback. They got they got wonderful. Yes. No, I'm asking if they got any feedback from misdetections or post so They got the what what was the feedback for? For Uh, yeah, so the, the block, uh, I gave an example of a block, the block is a summary of how you did, which the block is, right? A, a minute. Was it block or was it try by try? No, no. Okay, we re reconvene at uh, 5.20, so any questions now, I'll take the time of the you know, break that we have. So <laughs> any urgent questions, go ahead and ask. <laughs>